My name is June Cran. I've had the privilege of being president of MEDACT for some years and have been involved with it for even longer. And I can't tell you how thrilling it is to see such a, a wonderful group of people here today. As you know, uh, most of you, um, MEDACT has been in existence for a very long time and um, it has been very exciting since David took over as chairman and the board has been reviewing the activities um, that uh, we are now in a position to have a meeting like this to help the board to identify the priorities and the ways forward for MEDACT. So I'm not going to stay, <laughs> stop any longer, but I do want to introduce, first of all, Andy Haynes, who I'm sure is very well known to very many of you as a former director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Andy is really going to set the scene and, and the context for the issues that we uh, think are relevant to the future activities of MEDACT. Thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm going to do, as June has said, is I'm going to really give an outline of the sort of big picture of why MEDACT is needed now more than ever. I'm going to say something about some of the challenges that have confronted global health um, over recent years. Uh, there has been significant progress, but there are very, very major unresolved challenges. And I'm also going to talk about some of the big environmental issues that are with us today, but are coming very rapidly over the horizon to figure very largely um, in in coming decades and will very much shape, I think, the future of humanity. So there are these interlinked issues of poverty, inequalities, uh, problems with global environmental change, particularly climate change, but not just climate change, <coughs> militarization, uh, the remaining threat of nuclear weapons, and uh, it's probably just by good fortune, actually, that a nuclear weapon has not been detonated in error. There have been several accidents which have come very, very close uh, to a uh, nuclear weapon being detonated, and of course, as we know, uh, even more worryingly, to nuclear conflict. So it's these interrelated challenges, I believe, that will define the coming decades, the rest of the century, and beyond, and also pose a very important agenda uh, for MEDACT. Well, first of all, what about progress? We've seen really quite substantial progress. We have seen major progress in reducing under five mortality, some progress in maternal mortality, substantial increase in the coverage of antiretrovirals and aid for HIV AIDS, improvements in the management of TB, malaria and so on. So there have been serious um, improvements, but there are many uh, challenges remaining. And there's only two years, of course, before the Millennium Development Goals should be achieved and um, about 37 countries around the world are showing insufficient progress to achieve those goals in child health. And for about 18 countries, all of them in Africa, there's essentially no really substantial progress. So despite these gains, despite the fact we have many more effective interventions, despite the fact that health programs have been scaled up in many countries, there are still many, um, many steps to be taken in order to reduce child, maternal, adult mortality to levels uh, that are acceptable um, in, in a civilized world. We're also seeing that uh, with population growth, and of course the most recent projections suggest, the UN projections suggest perhaps 10 million people on the planet uh, by the end of the century, that even where we have achieved uh, Millennium Development Goals, for example in terms of urban slums, there have been uh, 100 million people uh, that goal has been achieved of moving people out of slum conditions. In fact, it's over 200 million people. But because of population growth and also migration, the absolute number of slum dwellers has increased uh, from nearly 800 million um, in 2000 to well over 800 million in 2010. So we've got to run fast just to keep up uh, with population growth. Population growth is declining in many parts of the world, but it's still very high in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and that in itself um, provides a challenge to, to health and well-being. We have seen some improvements in income poverty, so for example, if you look between 1990 and 2010, there's been a reduction in the number of people living in absolute poverty, from just under 2 billion to 1.2 billion, something of that order. But when you look at the slightly higher level, let's say $2 a day, progress is much less clear. 
So there's been relatively little change since 1981. And if we looked um, at three to five dollars a day, which is probably the minimum acceptable level, uh, then we would also see even less progress. So again, some progress with absolute poverty, but inequalities are increasing, and many people remain mired in, policy, in poverty. Transport through more active travel in cities and low emission vehicles. You could re reduce many deaths from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, many other conditions which are related to physical inactivity. Poor people, do, as I say, don't produce much greenhouse gas emissions, but one thing they do is to, because of poverty, their household energy involves very inefficient combustion of fuels, either biomass or coal. And that produces an enormous amount of indoor air pollution, which kills over 3.5 million people, particularly women and children. But also the black carbon and other pollutants contributes to global warming. So better cook stoves can save lives and reduce uh, climate change. And tra transforming our food and agriculture, perhaps the most difficult thing to do, uh, tackling some of our consumption patterns, overconsumption of animal products, for example, which is driving some of the um, uh, NCD epidemic, moving us towards healthier, low-carbon diets could also contribute both to health uh, and to sustainability. So with all this evidence, why are there barriers to policy change? Why aren't we seeing more action? Well, <clears throat> there's a great book which I would recommend to any of you who are interested called The Merchants of Doubt by two American historians, uh, Oreskes and Conway. And what they've done is to document the kind of history uh, of how really a very small number of scientists, many of them not specialists in either in public health um, or uh, in environmental issues, um, as they say, obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. And what's very striking about some of the arguments they make is that some of the institutions so-called think tanks and so on, particularly in the US, but some in the UK, um, who have been working on issues like tobacco, saying years ago tobacco was not harmful, trying to denigrate and undermine the science of tobacco and public health, are the same institutions that have been also trying to undermine the science on global warming. And this has, I think, led to confusion amongst the public about the relative importance of climate change, it feeds into the political short-termism of decision-makers who are concerned at the next election. Um, and it's made uh, a widespread misapprehension that the, the change is expensive and difficult. It is expensive. There would be some difficulties. There will be barriers. But it is, it is technically possible, technologically possible. Uh, and we need the political leadership um, to put that into, into action. So let me now conclude with the final part of the talk, which really brings us back to the original reason that those of you who were at the first meeting of the medical campaign against nuclear weapons, I think it was 1982 or something like that, joined the medical campaign, which is nuclear weapons. And MCA and W, in conjunction with the international umbrella organization, IPPNW, was very successful in demonstrating that the health impacts of, of uh, nuclear weapons <coughs> could not be addressed by health services, by health professionals, and that the only way forward um, was prevention. And I think the world was kind of lulled into a false sense of security by the uh, collapse of communism, uh, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. Much of the public believes that the nuclear weapons issue has gone away, and it hasn't, of course. And nuclear weapons stockpiles, um, still around 17,000 um, around the world, most, but not all, in Russia um, and the US. And the other extraordinary statistic is that 1,800 of these weapons are still on hair trigger alert. So they're still being maintained. They could be launched within a very short time. There doesn't seem to be any rational reason for maintaining them in that way. It's obviously extremely hazardous. It could lead to a nuclear war by, by accident. And the arguments, I think, for taking them off uh, nuclear, uh, this uh, hair trigger alert, uh, I think, are overwhelming, but so far have not been um, heeded. We've seen proliferation. We've seen countries like North Korea and so on, um, Israel, Pakistan, India, <coughs> all acquire um, nu uh, nuclear weapons. And the other, <coughs> I think, observation of scientific work over the last few years that's demonstrated um, why it's so important to address nuclear weapons is that in addition to the effects that we saw at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they have much wider 
effects as well. And in the 1980s, the phenomenon of nuclear winter became widely known. It was accepted, really, that if you detonated thousands of nuclear weapons, you would drive the world into a nuclear winter with plunging temperatures for many, many years. It wasn't realized until a few years ago that you could achieve a similar and still devastating effect with the explosion of much smaller numbers of nuclear weapons. So um, scenario modeling over recent years has shown that there could be profound climatic consequences of regional nuclear war. For example, between India and Pakistan, 50 weapons exploded on either side. <coughs> So the nuclear explosions would ignite fires that burn whole cities. The soot would be lofted higher into the atmosphere, absorbing incoming sunlight. And there would be a dramatic decrease in the amount of light reaching the surface, surface of, the, of the Earth, causing large and rapid drops in surface temperature, as um, demonstrated on this slide by Alan Robock, who's led a lot of, by the way, who's led a lot, um, led a lot of the research in this area. And this slide just shows you the climate change that we're being exposed to um, up, to, up to now, which is about 0.8 degrees. And what would happen if hundreds of these weapons were detonated? We might see uh, an immediate, almost immediate reduction in temperature, perhaps maintained for over a decade, which would devastate uh, agricultural productivity, resulting in a decline in available food, increase in food prices, making food um, inaccessible to hundreds of millions of the world poorest. And another striking fact is that the world's grain stores are only sufficient for about 60 to 80 days. So if we suddenly stopped producing enough grain to feed the world, we wouldn't have long to sort out the problem. And it's <coughs> striking, really, that we keep such small grain reserves, despite the relatively low costs of maintaining them. So there have been, uh, I think, some really positive <coughs> developments over the last year or so. And some of that's been as a result of IPP and W um, medical uh, activities around nuclear war. <coughs> which have now been taken up by the ICRC, International Committee of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which have acknowledged the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. And thanks to the government of Norway, who convened a meeting last March, attended by 128 states and other organizations. There's a whole movement now by a number, <coughs> a very large number of non-nuclear weapon states uh, to develop a consensus around the need to wor work towards very rapidly uh, nuclear abolition, because that's not happening through the conventional channels, through the NPT, for example. So that process needs to be re-energized. The health voice will play a very important role in that. And even in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a joint statement at the UN General Assembly putting the case um, for nuclear weapons um, to be tackled as an urgent humanitarian <coughs> issue. So what I've tried to do is to kind of set the scene to illustrate to you why MEDACT is needed now more than ever, why despite the fact that we've seen a lot of progress in our knowledge, in our ability to improve health, we are still stuck with very major and unacceptable inequalities in health and wealth, and we have these burgeoning crises coming over the horizon very rapidly uh, to confront us, at the same time as the unresolved issues like nuclear weapons that need to be solved urgently if we are to protect uh, humanity in the future. So MEDACT is needed to address these interlinked crises. It's needed to rebut some of the attacks on evidence and on science by special interest, promoting particular uh, points of view which are satisfying specific interests, specific commercial interests. And putting, heart at the very, uh, putting health at the very heart of development where it should be. So we need to think and question the current model of development, which is clearly unsustainable, and make a strong and united voice for putting health at the heart of development for the future. Thank you very much.